Welcome to 258 Studios Podcast. No, it's the. <laughs> all right. All right. So, all right. So, um, <clears throat> we haven't been around for a while. And we haven't been around for a while because um, we're busy. So yeah. <laughs> We're doing things. We're doing some things. So, um, we, we apologize for not doing that, but unfortunately, you know, we're not sponsored by Pepsi, so we're But if not, Pepe, Pepsi wants if, to if come Pepsi in... If Pepsi wants it, we will contractually obligate absolutely. ourselves to do that. We'll take a meeting. Um, but we're, you know, we we have to work, and we got a lot of irons in the fire, and the future is looking very strange, interesting, hopefully prosperous, and, uh, it and will wonderful. Be. Yeah, very bright. Um, I've been through some shit. <laughs> for the last four weeks, you've been through some shit. <clears throat> and um, we hopefully, don't need to we talk grow. About it. We um, grow. Um, oh, absolutely! I think every terrible situation is an opportunity to avoid a terrible no, situation it, in the future. Even in science, like shit, literally, you grow. So, I mean, it has to. It just has yeah. to. Well, even every bad experience should end up being a good experience because you're learning from it. You sound like me now when I have to tell that to you when things are happening. Well, then I'm going to stop saying that and I'm back to being No, I'm glad you're listening. That's great. <clears throat> so we had um, Stacy's very good friend, Jack Kugel, on, who litany of accreditations. And like Grammy nominated, um, you know, songwriter, producer. I mean, it's done everything, which you'll hear in the podcast. Um, been in the business. He's so I think Sony EMI is the most versatile artist and has like one of the largest catalogs. Um, he's he's just doing so much stuff, which you'll have to listen on the podcast. And he's and he's the kindest, sweetest, gentlest, most um, uh, what's the, what's the word? Um, and he's he, he knows everything about everything basically. Yes, and he's funny sometimes. And he's righteous, and I like that. Yeah, no, he's I, a, he's a really like normal, down to earth kind of person, and and you know, we all love those kinds of people. Yeah, the honest and the and, and the doesn't sincere, have to be if he doesn't yeah. want to no, because he could, he's. Paid You're his like, dues. Oh, you're all shitty people. I'm not going to deal with you. I mean, you, you like, hey, to. I'm working with Kesha today, but, you know, I'm still, you know, talking yeah, to what, you. Yeah, so, what, what are you eating for lunch? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we wanted to, I specifically wanted to um, give a lot of the, you know, young up and coming artists and, and people who are, you know, currently, you know, hoofing it just to just to get out there some perspective on, like, here's a guy at the top of the business. Um which for us in Little NEPA is a is a pretty extraordinary thing to get a, a get like Jack, and he was gracious enough to come in, and and he's gracious enough to hang out with us for a week, and uh, goddamn is he funny, and just like an encyclopedic knowledge of you know the music business, musicians, mm -hmm. you know producers, at, you know executives, engineers, like law. this guy, entertainment yeah, law. law. Mm -hmm. He knows all about them. He knows them personally. You know, and he's the one in in Congress or in Washington D.C. Like you know, ma making sure that artists are being treated fairly on the front lines. And you know, mm -hmm. it was it was awesome to have Jimmy Reynolds here because um, as you'll as you'll hear, there's a couple of moments where Jimmy's. Um, proverbial head explodes um like for stuff that he didn't know i know and i sent him like his bio before but i guess jimmy's a skimmer he's an english okay. teacher so he doesn't like looking at english more than he needs but you to. know what seeing him surprised like that it was like that was, it was worth it it was very good it was worth it it was very good so uh without further ado let's get to the intro <laughs> Well, I think we should start off first with the fact that Minnie Me passed away. I know. That's what I was trying to find the picture of because he signed one that said I completed him. So. Jimmy, how do you feel about that? Minnie Me? Yeah. That's sad. That's it. You have zero. I didn't know him personally, but it's an end of an <laughs> era. I remember he was in the Austin Power movies. And Celebrity Rehab or something, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, Surreal Life called? with Eric Estrada. <clears throat> oh, that's what's right. He was in this real life. Is that and when he was he going was around peeing in the plants. plants? Yep. I'm so glad that you watched reality TV. I caught you. <laughs> well, it was before Netflix. 
And he was driving his little cart in all the way. Everywhere. Know. Everywhere. It was amazing. And then when he ate that hoagie at Subway and it was bigger than him, those pictures on TMZ were just incredible. Where did he put it? With Jared? No. no he wasn't like sitting with Jared. The foot long <laughs> was half the size of his body. So he must have only been two feet tall. <laughs> Jack, how are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we... Um, do you do you want to do you want to tell how you met Jack? Because I met Jack through you, and I don't uh, know. well, I mean, Jack and I have known each other for. She's like, I think I was out in California on spring break with my roommate in like 2003. Mm-hmm. Was that right after you were on O Town? Um, was that making, making the, the band? band? Making the band. Yeah, they made him look really like nasty producer, but he insists I saw the it's edit editing. That. What was that? Why did they make you look? Did, did they because make you look like a sumbitch? Well, the episode was that um, Eric um, Estrada, not that Eric Estrada, but that <laughs> Eric Estrada. Wait, holy Eric, shit, Eric is Michael. Eric Estrada. Yeah, Eric Michael Estrada. Um, Wasn't really big on O Town. He um, he had just found his real dad, or his real dad had found him. That's right. So they wanted it to seem like he couldn't perform properly because he had all this drama in his head about his dad was weighing on him. And that really wasn't happening at the time, so they ended up cutting it as such. So it looked like, you know, they would keep focusing on shots of him looking down at the ground or, and shots of me going, no, that's not right, do it again. Like the, the, like the overbearing, like I don't care your emotional shit you're going through right now, you need to nail this. No, well, they didn't make it seem like I knew that he was going through it. It just was like I had a job to do and he wasn't giving me what I needed. And then the audience obviously knew why he wasn't giving. And he's like hands on his head, like shaking. Like I mean, is that a, is that? I mean, I mean, I want to get into your career and how you got started and everything. But like, is that one of those things like where people think reality TV is reality? Oh yeah, yeah. No, reality TV is a either scripted, outright scripted, or like literally like you have lines. Sometimes, or is, it, or is it like a lot of times? Like I know, I know with um, uh, the Gene Simmons show, you know, there were there were just episodes where the the parameters of what was going to happen you know there's one i think there's one episode where he's in a car with carrot top driving between vegas and la and the car breaks down he did the car was supposed to break down like you know you it was, wait it's that scripted yeah what other ones were you on what other shows oh god um i know you've done a lot i'm trying to think a lot of them um, the look, the Wilson Phillips one, right? You were, you were Santa. Yeah. He, well, we'll get into that. No, but that as far as yeah, I was. <laughs> what else? What else were you? <laughs> well, I mean, you've just been, you were on a, so many shows. Yeah, there's I mean, is been that one of those things of, like where you're in your life, you're like, I don't even know what I did anymore. I mean, if you it, it, almost if you think about the O Town thing, we had like 40 hours to get what we needed to make a record. We walked in. They put mic packs on us. They told us they had two crews because they knew we only had so much time with them. Right. Um, so they had two crews working around the clock following us as long as we wanted to work. Um, and there was no direction given to us. They were just capturing what they were capturing. But through the process of editing, you can make things appear however they want to appear. Now, there's something to be said, like when you see someone who's an a-hole on TV. Yeah. You can't look like an a-hole unless you give people a-hole moments to edit together. Sure. So. But do they have like segment producers there where they're like they're like oh something happened here and they're just they were yeah down? they were absolutely so they it's were not just like two dudes with a cam two dudes with cameras like there's other people in that room that are like behind the camera going like absolutely because my buddy was a pro- was a producer for the new Apprentice with Schwarzenegger and when when last time we went out to LA I had lunch with him and he was telling me like how it all works mm-hmm. and I was like. Yep, and you everybody's know, like, good. We, we ran into Donald Trump, actually. We went out. We, no shit. We were following, um, and this is interesting because it was way before. Jimmy, you ready? Inside show. info on our current president. Um, <laughs> we went out to the opening. I think it was like the opening of Planet Hollywood, New York. Right. And they had all the celebrities showing up. You know, Stallone was there. Um, and the producer said, you guys want to go with the band? Um to the opening we're like sure what the heck so we tagged along and as we were inside Donald saw the guys and the cameras and started to talk to them Wait, and, like, like, a, like a moth to a flame yeah and when it was over <laughs> the producer went up to Donald with a like a release a release on, yeah. a, on a, a clipboard yeah um, and Donald's like what's this I don't sign anything without my attorney and the producer's like well if you don't sign it you're not going to be on TV 
and he reluctantly signed it and then dropped it on the ground in front of her. Oh my gosh. Wait, so wait, wait, he was so pissed. He signed it? He signed it. And then dropped it for her to pick it up. Um, and what were you came- there? Yeah. I was standing, I was as close to him as you and I are. <laughs> what did you, wait, wait, what did you think? I was like, what a dick. But looking back, <laughs> but looking back on it, you know, the, who knows if, if him watching that and the making the band led him towards reality television. Wait, Maybe. was that the first time he was on reality TV? Oh, yeah. Like, he, he this was well before The Wait, Apprentice. holy sheep shit. The first time he was on reality TV was a show with you. Yeah, and I don't even know if, if, <laughs> if they used it during the, the, the course of the season because I only watched my episode. Sue me. <laughs> well, and now there's t-shirts online that just say like Jack Kugel uh, there's all kinds of weird yeah, stuff yeah but that one I think is funny It was. it's just the three it's, it's got, producers it's got names it's the lyrics for every six seconds and, and our names your names are on the front and I'm like why is your name on the front of a t-shirt with everybody it's like the most awkward thing yeah, it's weird it? no no I haven't bought it it's you weird. can google it can we, can can we, we buy, buy it, it for yeah. you can we buy it for you so you can wear it ironically <laughs> You could buy it for me, and I'll put it in a drawer. <laughs> it could be like your. It could be like I, I'm home you, and it's You could put like an arrow, like I, hello, I'm. Yeah, but we could, this we, one. We can like get like one of those, uh, like you circle it and draw like. That's an how arrow. you know you made it, though. I'm stupid. <laughs> when people put your name on a T-shirt and it's stupid, but like it's still out there. All right. So how did you? What was? What was? Let's get into your life, right? And I and I hope that I you know I hope you don't get offended by anything. Uh, never. <laughs> you don't seem like the guy who gets offended by anything. Not um, too often. Oh, actually, speaking of Trump, I should turn my Make America Great Again. Uh, at least it's around. in Russian. Yeah. I want to make sure that everybody knows the score. So, what, did you grow up in Southern California? No, I grew up in Connecticut um, from the age of zero to uh, 13. <laughs> so, like, your, your, your formidable years were... Yeah, well, it depends. Kind of like when you were coming into your own, like, 13 is right around the age of, like, where you're like, yeah. I'm going to be an asshole or I'm not going to be an asshole. Absolutely. Or, yeah. Yeah, no, I went from a, a small Connecticut town to moving to Los Angeles at 13. Bridgeport? No. Okay. It I was, also uh, lived there. That's the only way and, I can connect. Ansonia Woodbridge, just outside of New Haven. And then what, what, what? And we moved to, well, my dad was in the music industry as a producer. Um, Even in Connecticut. So what was he going to New York? Yeah, he, he had his first hit when he was 17 with a song called In the Still of the Night that he put out on his own label. Did you know that? Knight had no no clue. The Five yeah. Satins. Five right? Satins. And then he That's, also discovered... Just a little, that, wait, just that, a little song. That, it sure is. Did you know that? No. In the Still of the Night. Yeah, he recorded that in, in the basement of a church. Uh, Did he write it too? It. No, just produced it. Okay. Uh, and put it out on his label, and then it started to take off, so he went to New York and made it a deal with um, a gentleman named Al Silver, who owned Ember Records, and from there it just blew up. And to date, it sold about 50 million copies. Wow. And then your dad went on to, like, didn't he, he found the Carpenters? He and... found Richard Carpenter. Right, no, wait, so he goes, so you, wait, let's, okay. let's get All to right, L.A. All right, drive the boat. We'll but get there, he's we'll get not there. in L.A. Okay. But, uh, yeah, he, he's not in L.A. He, yet. He, um... He also discovered Richard Carpenter, a piano recital, and then worked with him and Karen until they wanted to move to L.A., uh, and he didn't want to go to L.A. yet, so he let them out of the contract and wished them well with the parents. And... With the, wait, wait, so he made, he made friends with the Carpenter's dad? Oh, he had, he had Richard under contract. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then he Where found... Was this the, at? This was still in, in Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah, and then uh, he was driving to New York one day, and he stopped at a gas station, and some kid pumping gas... Um, Asked him what he did, and um, my dad gave him his business card, and the kid hitchhiked to New Haven the next week. His name was Gene Pitney, um, who was a, a 60s uh, star who had quite a number of hits, very popular in England, etc. Really? Oh, yeah. So it was. So I, I so definitely you're grew growing up, up in this. Yeah, I grew up in this stuff. I got to. My dad would pull me out of school. I went to a private school, and he'd pull me out of school and take me with, with him to the studio in Bridgeport. Um, and I'd be an extra set of hands in the days before there was automation. So if you were doing mixing, they'd put phone books behind the board, and I'd reach over and I'd do pan moves or whatever was needed um, to be another set of hands. And I loved it. I just that's you so know. cool. And you were able to vote for the Grammys at like nine or eleven. You said yeah, because it, why it, do you? Why do you shrug, like, like, why do you kind of go like, oh, yeah. Oh, because well, it started I, out, it started I'll out as, a, for as a bit of a joke <laughs> or a, a dad thing. Because I had worked enough hours on a couple of albums that he was working on, um, either running the Echo Machines or whatever I was doing, where he thought it would be cute to give me an assistant engineer credit. And it said, like, assisted by Jack Google, age nine. Well, you only needed... Um, 
I think, six or 12 songs on an album to actually become a voting member for the Grammy Awards. So kind of a second addition to the ha-ha-ness of it, um, he went ahead and got me a, a membership to the Grammy Awards. And I ended up being like the second youngest voting member next to like Michael Jackson. Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> when I was nine, like I didn't do I was still anything. I my pants. I didn't even know. <laughs> my what kids to... are 11 and they're not even responsible and you're doing all this. <laughs> Wait, not, but I mean, most, most, in my experience, most fathers and sons don't really, you know, like it's usually like a sports thing that they're involved it in. It is. My dad was heavy set though. He was a big man and he was like six. Three, six, four, but he was always over 300 pounds. So he wasn't a real sports aficionado. He wasn't, you know, physically capable. So we bonded over music. And he would pick me up at private school and tell the principal, you know, she yelled at him one day because she's like, you know, this is the sixth time in the past four months you're taking him out of school. And he's like, he's going to learn more in the studio than he will here in your school. Clearly it worked. Um. I was like, yeah, go dad. Um, and he, you know, he kind of set the tone for me. I remember driving to the studio the first time, and I was eight, probably. And on the way there, he's like, now listen, you're going to hear a lot of adult words today. If I hear any of them out of your mouth, you're not coming with me again. But I'm going to tell these guys that they don't have to Filter feel themselves. uncomfortable yeah. around you. You're in their environment. And if you can show me that you're grown up enough to be in this environment, then you can come with me. And I dug it. You know, he even he even went so far as to forewarn me. He's like, once we're there, you can't tell me you're tired and want to go home later. You know, we're two hours away from My home. My kids never ever follow through on that. Well, what was your what was? I mean, obviously your mom was around, right? Oh yeah, and she was just like, yeah, take Jack. Yeah, take. Well, I, I was always the 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 really smart kid that would talk to the adults. You know, I, I was the kid that my mom said she used to toss a uh, transistor radio in my crib when I was like <laughs> two or three and that it would keep me occupied Saturday morning so they could sleep because I would take the whole thing apart and unwind the transformer and I'm in like just you know crazy crap um, You're like I, I was a real smart little kid and I and I loved talking to adults more so than kids my own age even um, so being around adults and being given the privilege to earn the right to be there and learn I was in heaven that's but so how, cool. But how do you know that, like, at nine, where you're like, I, you know, I don't want to go play with my friends. I like it. He I did transistor radios, I, took them apart when he I was did, you know, two. <laughs> I, I love, how do you know that? I could get, I get the, I can understand it. Being with my dad playing all those years. That's yeah, true. I'd go really to the cool. bars you with him. in that too, didn't Yeah, because I remember, that's why I love, I was telling him yesterday, I love tape machines, because I remember staring up at my dad's, because I was too young to be level with it. And But I'd be watching him record, same thing, though, like... I knew that he was there with his friends recording things and I couldn't be like, I want to go home or I would go to his band practice with them. And the same thing, like they'd be drinking beers and talking like adult men. And, but to me, like I never repeated any of those words and I was just happy. I felt cool to be included in that totally. club. And that's why I have so much insight on music because I could hear that they would jam and make mistakes on purpose to make each other laugh. And it was just being in that whole environment and understanding how music works. And it's not just technicalities. It's like a, a bond you have with people and to be included. It's cool. Well, I, you know, maybe from both of your points of view, because obviously Stacey and I didn't grow up. No, but that's yeah. so cool. But, but, but between you guys and maybe you guys can share the story of it. Yeah. Like, do you, do you remember like that moment where you're like, 100%. this is what I want. I remember I was three years old. I remember it like vividly. I remember being, it was in the basement of my grandparents' house where my dad's studio was. And I remember like feeling the floor vibrate because they were downstairs recording. And um, my aunt had to stop me because I was like trying to jump up and hit the, the lock because it was one of those little latches yeah. to be able to go downstairs with my dad. And I finally did get down there and then I was hanging out with them for a while. And But then I would, there was a little stoop. I would sit at the stoop all the time and just listen to them practice and look up. I remember looking up at Mike stands and guitars and looking up at the drums and that his drummer had a million drums, but it was just like, this is so cool. Uh, even up in the high school, like I spent many a Friday nights with my dad and my uncles and my cousin recording and stuff because I had more fun doing that than being out doing stupid stuff. That's really cool though for son and yeah. father bonding. Well, yeah, and then, well, I mean, like and then through and then through college, yeah. I, I was in a band with my dad and still am. You know, that's cool. yeah, no, that's awesome. Do you remember that moment for you? I don't know if I remember the exact moment th back then. I just I knew that I loved, you know, when I when I would hang out at the studio, if I needed a break out of the control room, I would go to the pool table and play pool by myself or I would go lay on a couch if I was tired. But there was a, a storage room where all the extra instruments were stored.
and they had a uh, harpsichord and they had a um, um, tubular bells. Um, oh, like, wow. like exorcist. The exorcist, yeah. 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 Uh, with the mallet. Right. And they had um, glockenspiels and all these instruments, you know, and all kinds of percussive instruments too that I got to play with and learn what they sounded like. And nobody was stopping me and no one was yelling at me or saying, don't touch. And I, I learned a lot about instruments just from being there. There was a piano in the other room that I got to tinker with and, you know, things like that were amazing. And then as my dad would do productions, um, getting ready for a production, especially when you're looking for material back then, people would send you cassettes or little vinyl records. or um, And he would literally get mailbags of submissions when he was working in essence, on, demos. Yeah, mailbags. I mean, mail, big ass mailbags. And he would hand me one of them one day and he said, take this up to your little Mickey Mouse machine upstairs. And if you hear something you like, let me know. Wow. And this is at nine? Yeah. Yeah, so I had all these. So what, what he did for me without me realizing it back then was by listening to all these songs from pro writers, even if they were piano, vocal, demo, um, I was inherently learning... Um, formulas for song, how long, you know, uh, the formula of an intro, a verse, a B section, a chorus, without ever knowing what I was learning. I was, I was being exposed to it, um, you know, obviously along with the radio, but getting to hear things finished on the radio versus a piano vocal demo, it was very different. So what's that like, what's that called? My, my, mitosis or... Like, like when you're around and you just absorb it? Maybe. Osmosis. Osmosis. Osmosis, Jesus. yeah. Thank you, teacher. Yeah, yeah mitosis just, sounds like something we, like I got a black lung. That's a something. disease, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> what happens if you're eating romaine lettuce this week. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's a callback. Um, uh-huh. so, how did, so when did the transition come from like, all right, we're getting out of Connecticut? Um, when I was like 13... Um, my dad had signed an artist to Jet Records, which was what Ozzy was signed to, um, which was owned by Sharon Osbourne's father. Um, um, and we were moving to, to L.A. and making the family move. And we moved in August of 1980. And then my dad had a massive heart attack and passed away in November of 1980. Get the fuck. So I remember... Being in the car with my mom, headed home, um, because she had dropped my brother off earlier in the night, and then he passed away, and she had to come back, and I was at the hospital with his secretary hanging out, and when we were driving home, she kind of pulled over and was breaking down a little bit, and she said, you know, what are we going to do? Should we go home? And I was like, well, all the wisdom at 13. Home, Connecticut was home when he was alive. He's not alive anymore. We're here. We'll just stay here, I guess. And she was dumb enough to go along with it. Wow. Um, or smart enough. <laughs> or smart, or smart enough. enough. Yeah. Um, I mean, was that? I mean, was that like like your world fucking stopped, or or was? You know, when for me, when he passed away. Um, as an adult, we tend to look at kids and go, oh, my God, that had to be so tragic or so hard. And it was. It was definitely hard. It was definitely tragic. I missed the guy a lot. But I moved into a place, and maybe I had to move into this place for my own psyche, of attempting to be the n- the next man in the house. Like, I had to take care, felt like I had to take care of my mom. I ended up um, forging— the Responsibility is now transferred to you. Yeah, even though that was a crock of shit. As, you know, looking back as an adult, but as a kid, I felt like I had to, and it probably helped me focus on, you know, staying sane. Right. Um, I forged my birth certificate when I was 14 to make it say I was 16 so I could get a job at the theater as an usher. So I started working at 14. Actually, I started working at 13 uh, when my dad was still with with us because I got a job at the, um, and this was because I watched too much Caddyshack. I got a job at the Beller Country Club. Country Club. So my dad would drive my ass to the Beller Country Club at 5 a.m. Um, so I could go get in a couple of rounds of golf. And it was cool. I got to caddy for people like Vin Scully and, and um, um, Fred McMurray from really? Life Recent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a trip. Um, so I did that for a while. And, you know, I started working really young. I was always very independent. Um, and as, as I said, I was a, a usher at a theater. Um, I sold Jack Klugman. 
from the Odd Couple opened oh. up. A, wait, 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 wait. He opened up a place called Jack's Corn Crib. It was popcorn he was selling, <laughs> uh, and I sold popcorn for him. And <laughs> I had crazy, crazy jobs. Uh, L.A. Was, is unique. <laughs> I, was a, I, I was a furniture polisher at a store. Uh, I was a waiter. Um, then I eventually I started moving to to music business oriented jobs and trying to work your way into actor. I went to acting class too. You did. You were in summer re- school? Summer school? Yeah. No, you fucking weren't. Yeah. Just as Mark an, just, yeah, yeah, just as an extra. I did what other ones lines. were you in? Oh, I did a ton of extra work. I know, um, but what is the bigger one? Fright ones? Night. Um, mm-hmm. I love summer school. Summer school was cool. Yeah. I love summer school. I remember growing up, I have a, I have a really crazy uh, golf story too. It's not crazy. It's just like more of my, and it fits into music. I was at a golf tournament. I believe at the time for Sons of Anarchy, they would do a golf a golf tournament. So season one, we had a golf tournament, and at the golf tournament, we somehow got behind Smokey Robinson. <laughs> and I remember the the girl I was with was like not like romantically, but like she was my boss, and we would we would, and she's like, "Yo, that's Smokey Robinson." So he was taking too long, so I kept going. Tears of a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and he would go like, I get it, I get it, I get it. And oh I'm my like, gosh. I'm like, come on, Smokey, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> he was really nice after the 18th hole. Like, we were, I was just like, hey man, I was, you know, you don't know me from Adam, but <laughs> that's I thought funny. You'd get a kick out of it. That's Which funny. Is the same thing I did to What's His Face from Outcast, Andre 3000. We were at Trader Joe's, or no, what, what's the Redner's? What's the one that's open like 24 hours? I don't know, but what did you do? <laughs> he was in like the all natural aisle and we were drinking and we showed up at like 1 a.m. and he's walking through like the whole, the, the all natural aisle, like the gluten free one. Yeah. And I just kept walking. It was when organics ro- roses really smell like poop, poop, poop. <laughs> that was when that song was big and I was walking by and I was like, roses really, and he was dressed like Colonel Sanders, which was really strange, but I was like, roses really, and Josh Dobkin was like, oh my gosh, but he gave the nod and he's like, I get it. Um, <laughs> So, so going, doing all oh those like odds and end jobs. I mean, in a weird way, it actually gives you like an idea of like from, from the top down of like what this industry totally. is. And well, for me, I didn't, I never really, especially after my dad passed, I never thought about essentially going into music because to me, music was almost a hobby because mm-hmm. I'd grown up around it so much. Right. Um, and being in LA, I wanted, I went to acting class. I thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, and in my house, going to college was, what you did did it was there was no option i wasn't i wasn't given it was a the, foregone conclusion oh yeah i didn't <clears throat> dare breathe the words i'm not going to college i right. have no teeth um <laughs> so i went to uh ucla and i was studying psychology and my game plan at that point was to become a music business attorney or an entertainment attorney um but i found myself up late at night um i guess i bought a keyboard and find myself writing songs. And I finally got the nerve up to play my mom a song, I think probably at the end of my first year of college, because she was a manager in the industry as well. So, what did she, what did she manage? Musicians? Ba- yeah, bands, musicians, bookings, wow, you know, okay. things like that. Um, and my fear with her was that she would... But that's the business side of the of, of oh, music. Yeah. yeah, okay. But she also had a creative ear. Okay. So my fear in playing her anything was she would either patronize me or be like, you know, great but you're still going to school yeah not that i had thought about leaving school at that point but i played her one song and she said it's really good she said but you need more than one song so keep writing and play me more well cut fast forward to my th- end of my third year of college um i think i played her five or six things and when they were done she said they're excellent she said they're all really good she said you know i don't want you to become a frustrated music attorney who never knew if he could. If this is something you're passionate about, I will support you mentally. I'm not giving you a dime because our agreement was she would pay for me to be in college. Yeah. She said, but if you feel like you don't want to go back to college and you want to pursue this, um, know that I think you have my blessing and that I think you have enough talent where it's worth you pursuing it if it's something you love. You'll have to get a job and figure out how to support yourself, um, but you have my blessing. Yeah. So, did that mean a lot to you at the time? Yeah, of course. I mean, my mom was. Both parents were always really supportive, and I know, you know, I remember hearing my dad bitch about his mom talking about him not having a real job. Right. Uh, he sleeps during the day and plays at night, and you know, so it's 
I, I know historically um, it was hard to get support from your parents. Right. So to have my mom give me that kind of support was awesome. Um, and then I went into holding a myriad of jobs on the peripheral of the music industry. Um, I worked for a music industry tip sheet called Hitmakers that was a radio magazine. They would track... Um, new songs that came out and what stations were on them. You'd see ads for new things like that. And then ultimately I went to work for Diane Warren, um, helping her with her publishing company and running the front office um, before I was able to um, land a publishing deal. And the way that all came about... um, Now, a publishing deal for the uninformed is... A publishing deal is when someone pays you a salary for a percentage of your income. It's actually a really horrible deal. If you can avoid it, do so. But <laughs> it's a way... To, it's <laughs> like a bad loan. Publishing. It sounds so intriguing, though. It's like, ooh, it's, a publishing it's a, it's deal. It's basically a loan that you're paying you know, 25% interest on, uh, except the interest you're paying is you're giving away ownership, 25% ownership of, of your property for someone giving you money to live on so you can not have to hold a job. And, and it's your IP, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I don't think a lot of, like, we have a lot of, a, a lot of, I think there's a real, a, like, a lot of really talented musicians in this area. Mm-hmm. And it's usually, it usually happens when you come from an area that's kind of, like, depressed and, and, you know, financially, like, eh, we're this close to, like, bankruptcy or receivership. And I equate it to, like, when, you know, when Springsteen was writing about his songs in the, in the 70s and, like, you know, he's coming from, you know, basically nothing, like the Rust Belt. Um, but I, but a lot of them don't know, like, the process. They just think, like, if you write it and record it, they will come. Yeah. If you write it and record it, they will come, but you won't own it. You know, my... <laughs> 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 it's funny. My, honestly, my business partner, Jamie Jones, who's in, in the group All for One, likes when we, we, we'll, t- we'll talk to kids at colleges or wherever. Um, and Jamie often says, you know, I didn't know what publishing was until I learned I had given my own away. Wow. So Why is that like one of those little like well, nebulous things in, the, in here, the industry? Because there's no vetting in the music industry. It's it's the only industry where on Friday you can be a, a, an inmate in a maximum security prison. And on Monday you can be the fully funded CEO of a multinational conglomerate. There's no vetting. Death row? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, is that Shug? It, yeah. Well, yeah. So... The drug starting. Money, I mean, if, right? if you go back to the fifth. Go back to the fifties. So the mafia was very involved in the industry. You know, they would they would own. Oh really? Oh god, yeah, yeah. The the things would happen in the in the fifties where you know a a truckload of records that was already sold would get hijacked and disappear, and then those records would magically show up again and get sold again. Isn't so that, the isn't records that buying it twice. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, you got it. So they were like the first like black market Louis Vuitton bags. Like they took them. The music industry was there, there was no regulation on it. You know, you it wasn't until the Copyright Acts of like seventy eight where it's actually protected. I mean, what was the movie? Um, uh, Why the fools fall in love with um, uh, Frankie Lyman? You know, the, I'm sure you saw that movie about years where, and years ago. Yeah, basically, the person that owned the record label took all the writing credit for the song. And he wasn't paid a dime for years until laws changed, which basically now you can't, in the U.S., you can't give away or sell your writing portion of a song unless it's a a total work for hire. Um, But while you can sell your your publishing, the the writer's performance side by law is always got to be yours. That way, Congress felt it would stop the abuse. Um, that took place in the 50s and 60s. And they were writing that in what, 78? Yeah, 70, 76 or 78 is when that, that went into effect. Wow. So you're out in LA in 80. Yeah. Right? Working yep. crazy all over All kinds of, yeah, and going to school and, you know, being a kid and doing my thing. <coughs> so what, you graduated? Graduated in 84. Went to, went to college, as I said, for those three years. Then when I left school, yeah. um, as I, I ultimately I ended up working for Diane Warren and, um, I was dating uh, my wife at the, uh, is uh, Mama Cass's daughter, uh, Owen. And she was good friends with Carney and Wendy. Um, Wilson. Wait, so this is right out of, this is like basically out of school? Yeah, well, we, we had all met in acting class. Um, 
And, and this is the mamas and the papas mom, mamas and, Yep. Mm-hmm. And she was good friends with China Phillips and Carney and Wendy Wilson and a whole and Moon Zappa and you know all the, right. the 60s kids and she had an idea I guess to do a um, a charity record for like drug abuse where she called all her friends together and said why don't we try to do a record and sing and the only people that responded were Carney, Wendy and China so they ended up all singing together um, and they did cut some demos together but Owen has a very powerful voice like her mom did Yeah. and she wasn't blending with them so they decided to do their thing and she decided to do her thing they became Wilson Phillips um, <laughs> Just, I was very friendly with them. <laughs> right. And they were fans of mine as a songwriter, for, you know, just the things that I would play them. And I remember Carney had called me up when China wanted to do a solo project. And she said that the label wanted her and Wendy to do a Christmas album. Um, and they possibly wanted her to do something with her dad. And I said to her, are you going to write something? Because, in, in, again, growing up with my dad in the industry, he always told me about how valuable holiday songs were Christmas songs that they come right. back every year and they're like an annuity. I yeah. think Paul McCartney on um, simply having a wonderful Christmas time makes $200,000 off of that every year. Alone. Mm-hmm. We were looking up song facts. When and a lot of them are it. from Jewish people, aren't they? The yeah, Christmas like, songs. Like Christmas, like Christmas right? was written by uh, by a nice Jew. Um, so And yours. Yeah. So long story <laughs> short, um, I said to Carney, are you going to write something? And she goes, I don't know. I said, you have to write something. She said, well, I might want to do it with my dad. I said, I don't, I don't care who you do it with, but you got to write a song for this album. Well, like two, three weeks later, she calls me up and she goes, do you want to try to get together and write something? I'm like, sure. Uh, and again, I'm working for Diane Warren's office at this point, answering the phones, making tape copies, getting her coffee, whatever. And she comes over but with Wendy. But you're known for your songwriting. Well, um, just amongst... Our friends, I haven't had any yeah, success it's not like at a, all. A massive thing, but they know that you. They, they, you can they know write. that I can write and that I want to be a writer. Right. So they come over, Carney and Wendy, and we write um, for I don't know a couple of hours and don't really come up with much more than a chord progression. And Carney has this idea that she wants to call the song "Hey Santa," which I think is really stupid. But <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, she wrote that song. He did. Yes. Hey, Santa. I hear it in Garrity's no every no, year. No way. So, yeah. so now, me, it gets better. You, yeah, it does get better. So let me tell you what happened. So <laughs> Jimmy's 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 mouth Jimmy's fingers are in his mouth right now. <laughs> I'm working for well, Diane. Was, we were gonna cover that. I'm working once. for Diane Warren, and if anybody doesn't know who Diane Warren is, look her up. She's probably the most prolific. She just said Lady Gaga stuff with Lady Gaga she's and everything. Done, everybody knows. She's had more number one hits than almost anybody I can think of. And at that point in time, because I worked for her, I knew she was about to be announced as the ASCAP writer of the year for a second year in a row. And she asked me what I was doing or something, and and I told her that I had a session with Carney and Wendy, and she's like, would you want some help? And I'm thinking to myself, holy crap. First of all, this woman doesn't write with anybody except for, like, Michael Bolton and Desmond Child. Right, right. And I was like, yeah, let me call Carney and Wendy. And they were like, sure, have her come over. So she comes over the next night, and we worked again. Didn't well, we got somewhere, but when it was all said and done, Carney and Wendy stayed late and they said, Listen, we really don't like where she's going with this. We liked where you were going with it better. So, can you like <laughs> kick her to the curb? <laughs> and I'm like, Awkward. I'm like, you know, uh, 23, was I 23? Yeah, I can't remember, 24, 5, uh, whatever I was, I was a young kid in awe of the fact that I had a chance to write with someone I idolized. Um, and now I had a kicker off the song. Holy so, shit. So, and, and I still, then that's my bread and butter money. I work for her. So <laughs> I called her up. We should have thought this and, through. <laughs> yeah. And she was totally cool. She was like, you know, fuck them bitches. Um, <laughs> but that's Diane. Nowhere. That's Diane. And she understood and I, I felt horrible, but we, we, um, didn't get together again yet. Now, I'm working at Diane's office, and I get a phone call for Diane from a gentleman named Jay Landers. And at the time, Jay Landers um, was one of the heads of um, SBK, uh, A&R. A&R is artist and repertoire. They pick the songs and the producers. And, and uh, he said, so they're hey. not just scouts? No. Yeah. Okay. He said, hey, hey, Jack, it's Jay Landers. It's Diane. And... Um, and I said, yeah. And he said, oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Don't send me through yet. I said, what? He said, I heard you wrote a hell of a Christmas song. And I said, 
you did? He goes, yeah, I talked to Carney. I can't wait to hear it. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, I wrote a hell of a Christmas song. I'm excited for you to hear it. <laughs> he goes, great, I can't wait for you to hear it. And I'm thinking to myself, well. So the next day I get a call from Carney and Wendy's manager, who is a gentleman named Mickey Shapiro, who is an attorney, and he managed Fleetwood Mac and mm -hmm. Steely Dan and a whole bunch of people. Um, and he said, can you come into my office around lunchtime? I want to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So I take lunch and I go to his office and when I walk in, he meets me with his outstretched hand and he shakes my hand and he says, congratulations. And I said, congratulations on what? He goes, well, I got you the production on the Christmas song. And I went, Mickey, there is no Christmas song yet. <laughs> he said, we well, better hurry up and fucking write one. You're in the studio on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. So now I go back to, and I think this is Thursday or Friday. I go back to the office and um, I went to Diane's head like you're of. You're still an employee answering oh, yeah. phones right now. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I go back to the office and I talk to the head of the company, a woman named Doreen. Um, and I said, listen, I have this opportunity. I have to take it. I need time off like immediately. Um, and she said, okay. You know, do you take the time and we'll figure out what we're going to do and make it, make this work. So I take the time off and um, we got together and wrote what ultimately became Hey Santa. Um, and at this point, I get the, the, the nod that, yes, it's going to go on the album. Um, but all I have at this point is one song on one album, which I'm co-producing with Carney and getting half of a normal producer fee, which I think at that time, I think I got like $1,500 or something. So I go back. Now I get a call from Doreen and she says, listen, we've talked about this amongst ourselves. Um, we normally have a policy where we don't um, hire songwriters to begin with because it's sort of a conflict of interest. Um, but we hired you because we needed somebody and you were a friend and blah, blah, blah. But we know that your heart isn't here in the office. Your heart's here. So we're going to let you go. So and I'm thinking, fired. basically. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit. I just gave up my job for $1,500. And I'm like, okay, I'm letting this settle in and sink in. And they said, you know, if, if you need some part-time work, we'll try to figure something out. But I'm going, okay, did I make the right choice here? What am I doing? Yeah. Fortunately, I did a decent enough job on the, and they were happy enough with Hey Santa where they gave me two more songs on the album. And then through Mickey, um, he was able to help secure my first publishing deal with EMI, um, which allowed me to not have to work for somebody and then continue to work on my craft and write and pitch songs until I had another hit. And he was Santa Claus in the music video for Hey Santa. How did they convince? That's so cool. <laughs> the, the head of video is a guy named Jeff Panzer, who's a wonderful man. He's um, an erotic Jew from New York. With a, You Jews stick together. We do. We do. Um, and... Um, I love Jeff. He used to, I used to, I used to fear going to Jeff's office because back in those days, marijuana was still illegal in most parts of this country. And Jeff <laughs> smoked more than anybody I could ever imagine. But he was, he was the most diligent worker. He was the first guy I'd ever seen who, who was a stoner that could actually would be at work at 5 a.m. every day in that office. That's incredible. It was insane. So um, he'd wake and bake and then go. Oh, yeah. And, and when, if God forbid he saw me in the hallway and I didn't come to see him, it was, like I committed the, the most uh, heinous crime, heinous crime, and and I had to think about what I had to do for the rest of my day because I knew if I went to go see Jeff and say hello to him in his office, my day was over because I was going to be stoned out of my mind. Because yeah. it would be like turning down a you know, an offer from somebody. I yeah, didn't want to insult the guy. Um, but long story short, when he was doing the video, he was like, you know, I want to do this video where we're making a video behind the scenes, um, and I want to have. Carney's fam and Wendy's family in it and make it, you know, the, well, I want you guys to be in it. And he was like, how'd you like to play Santa? And I'm like, oh, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. <laughs> and I'm like that. I was actually pretty skinny back then. Um, but, um, you know, I was honored to do it and it was fun. And, and, uh, and I've got a piece of video memento footage. It's so cool though because um, I hear it all the time and during like for Christmas I hear it at Cooper's like on repeat every time I go to the grocery store and I'm just like, oh my god, it gets in your head and it's just so catchy. You want to hear something? You want to hear something really funny? <laughs> you were 
Wait, wait, wait. You were gonna cover it? No, no, no. So, so Jimmy goes. Jimmy goes. You wrote "Hey Santa." No, I know. And and I see him over there. Jack continues his story. You were gonna steal his song <laughs> and re-record it. Oh, caught! And make a push song out of it. It was considered. He only made fifteen hundred. It was considered. <laughs> Yeah, my friend. Now all things, now all things being considered, what they do is considered. I, I, it, would, it would have to be considered satire, even though they don't change the lyrics, the content of what they do. Do you need him to play Santa for your music video again? Oh. <laughs> the last person who played Santa was Lee, and this is when I barely knew Jimmy, and they wanted to do a slow motion shot of Lee. Eating cookies while they were throwing, we were like crawling them, of dumping milk. milk on them and throwing. You cookies guys are at such good just, friends. Oh. <laughs> of milk. That's how I met Lee, and that's how oh I knew God. he was a good friend. Yeah, we put him right in my shower, and we just and, and and being that you're shooting like sixty or 120 frames a second, it happens fast. Just be like sexy, like like sexy. Oh my they were God, telling him to be sexy, and he was like rubbing his face. It was oh just my God, milk it's on YouTube. Um, <laughs> well, so is the Hey Santa just video. Find it funny, where <laughs> no, it's so crazy. Where you're literally, like yeah, my friend like, and I, like every year, we would cover. We have like a fictional band, and it's like he was saying satire, but we would, but we wanted to be like a modern day like power duo, like Hall and Oates, but covering this is Christmas such a music. Cool so moment. we're grow, grown men with here's the facial guy. hair. Act, and we, we we did a whole bunch of them. You're sitting next to the guy that you were gonna fucking steal <laughs> from. I just want you to. You might no, as well just no, no, walk no. It's not house. stealing. It's like this trying is to awesome. Reignite, respark the interest in that song. You you say what you want. You can do parodies. <laughs> you can do parodies. All right. So so it seems oh, cool. to, it seems to me that that situation kind of concreted you into this business, or am I? Am yes and no. There? It, what happened was. Um, I worked with Carney and Wendy pretty exclusively. Plus, you got two songs. What on the on the Wilson Phillips album? No, no, no. I had I had three three on the Christmas album, and then I was working with them pretty exclusively because they were working on their next project. We was didn't that, know. Was that the follow up to like Hold On? No, and- it was a follow follow up to effectively Shadows and Light, but they didn't know if China was going to be back in the group or not. And ultimately, China was China's solo album didn't do much. Um, and the label dropped them in like 90, I signed my deal in 93, four or five, around 95, they dropped them. So I basically devoted two years. Now, when you sign a publishing deal, at least back then, I had a commitment to deliver so many songs, 10 songs that I had to write a hundred percent by myself. So if I co-wrote them with one person, that's 20 songs. Right. If I co-wrote them with two people, that's 30 songs. Uh, once you meet that commitment, then if you owe them money or have not earned money, they're going to drop you. If you have earned money, they may pick up your option and move into another, another. And they put that in catalogs. Do they, you have catalogs there? Is that how that works? Um, well, yeah, yeah. Your songs stay with them as, catalog um but i had no catalog i had songs i mean i had songs but songs that were written for the for the girls project right and i mean specifically for that yeah so when they got dropped i was like oh shit i owe emi like three songs and if i turn in these three songs the other seven aren't going anywhere at the moment and i've only had hey santa out i'm probably going to Go back to waiting tables. What am I going to do here? Yeah. I wasn't sure. So I dragged out turning in those last three songs for a year, I think. I made sure every... Like were they already done and you're just like... No, no, no. I, I made sure... I, I wrote probably 40 songs to turn in three because I wanted to make sure that every piece of a song that came in, if I co-wrote it, whatever, was as good of a song as it was going to be because I wanted to continue the relationship with EMI. And I ended up getting a number of cuts um, around the world. And um, in 1990, uh, was it 90? They picked up the option in 96. In 97, I got a phone call from my publisher who said there's this solo piano player named Jim Brickman who had an album out that did pretty well. He does like romantic piano ballads. And he usually has one vocal song on each album and uh, I wanted to set him up with you to write a song so I said okay and I listened to the, his first album and the first vocal um, that he had on that album um, which was called By Heart I believe and I was pretty impressed by it I thought it was it was a well written song um, and we get together 
and he comes over and we worked for probably two or three hours and really fleshed out the music um, for something pretty cool. At which point he stands up and uh, I thought we were going to take a break and he goes, no, I'm going to take off. And I'm like, you're going to take off? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I don't do lyrics. And he said, uh, but even though I don't, don't do lyrics, uh, I don't know, I'm feeling like maybe we, if we, maybe there's a way you can call the song Valentine or my Valentine or something about Valentine. I've never had a Valentine's Day song and I'm romantic. And Right. So the holidays have been your... Yeah. So he <laughs> leaves and as he's leaving, I'm cursing him as he's walking away because I did do lyrics, but I had not written a lyric solely by myself since before I was signed and I wasn't overly confident about doing it by myself. I enjoyed the process of co-writing. Right. Um, was it the collaboration that you liked or was yeah, it? Yeah, it's just being able to buy, exactly, yeah. exactly. It helps validate and you know, you can tell what sucks versus what doesn't suck and, but I had no choice but to write this song, something about a Valentine and um, <laughs> it was around, I remember well, it was around the 4th of July because um I'd worked on it for like two days and the first two days were I, I went down the wrong road of like roses are red and violets are blue and just horrible shit. Yeah. Um, and on July 4th, we, I was supposed to go with my family to a, a 4th of July celebration at someone's house and I sent them and I was like, I'm, I'm working on this. I promise I'll be there as soon as I can, but I, I, I just got to get over the hurdle. Yeah. And I finally realized in my own mind at least that the only way I thought it was going to work is if I used it purely as an endearing term having nothing to do with Valentine's Day right um just like an admission of love if you will yeah and I wrote a song called Valentine that ultimately Martina McBride ended up singing and I was blessed in that it was uh, it was a number one adult contemporary record it was a number three country record and then it entered the main charts and climbed to like the top 20 uh it Sold oh, sold three million copies for Jim and four million copies the next year for Martina, um, and it was that was my first big hit. Sweet, seven million copies in total. Yeah, plus singles. That was that was albums, and then there was another million in singles, I think. And you were nominated for Grammy for that? No, not for no, that. no, not for that. Sorry. Wait, so what's that? I mean, it, that's <laughs> that solidified. That solidified. Yes, that was. A, and what was a trip about it was when it came out, I was you know again. Every, all these little areas that I had worked at in my career working for hit makers, I knew how to track a record. I knew how... We, when a record comes out, they, they talk about how many ads it gets or additions to playlists. So if something's strong and there's 140 stations that are sampled to determine what a chart position is, if you come out of the gate with 100 stations that are playing your record, it's off to a very good start. And we were off to a great start, but my fear was they released this thing in January of 97... And we're barreling towards February 14th. And I'm like, holy crap. What? Because they totally promoted it as a Valentine's Day record. Right. And I'm like, well, what happens on February 15th? Does oh, it shit. go away? Yes. Um, fortunately, because I think I took the approach of writing it not as a Valentine's Day song, but as I said, just a, an, a, uh, an Valentine admission. Valentine was the uh, rosebud right. of the whole thing. February 15th came and didn't disappear. March came, April came, May came, June, July. Finally, in August, it started to slip. Was it like a wedding song, too? People oh, it's used huge, it for. Huge wedding song. Holy That's amazing. Shit. Yeah, so. I mean, what's that like? I mean, as, as an artist, like, what's that like? Week That's to so. Week, gotta week be so week, exciting. Going, like, it was amazing. Holy I mean, shit. It was, holy yeah, shit. It was, holy shit. You know, it's. We all. Like eventually, to our, you become desensitized to it. You're just like, ah, do we just? No, I, I would. Number that, one that, again. That, I mean, it was, it was great to buy a house. It was great to be able to go get a check that had lots of zeros at the end of it. Um, every time it came on the radio, I still got excited. You know, there's something fresh about hearing your song on the radio, even if you've listened to it 3,000 times, putting it together before it's finally ready. Right. Once you hear it on the radio, it's almost like listening to it or looking at it with new eyes because it's it's in a new realm. You see that in the movies. Like, you you don't normally experience it, so that's got to be so cool. So, okay, so then... So then from there... but how So how did you become... In the midst of this, did you have to... I mean, you were already working with your dad, but like... Did you have the foothold about how to like how to how to how to record how to engineer? I, I, I learned a lot growing up of the basic principles of recording, 
when Wilson Phillips was doing their first album, because I was friendly with them, I got to hang out in the studio with Glenn Ballard, who was producing Hold On and some of those great records. Um, and I remember saying to Glenn, you know, do you, uh, I went with Owen, and when she, she, she grew up around all this stuff and would didn't really enjoy hanging out. And I said to her, listen, if I'm not a pain in the ass and it's not, and nobody minds and the girls are cool, are you cool leaving me here? Let me hang out just to watch. And she, she was fine. And I talked to Carney and she's like, I don't care. Just make sure Glenn's cool. So I said to Glenn, can I just hang out and watch? I won't say shit. And he's like, totally. He put a chair up next to me, next to the board at the end. And I got to watch him comp their vocals and how he chose what, lines he liked and his his way of working with them um and it you know i had other than watching my dad i had not seen a lot of producers so it was it was a learning experience and it, it kind of reaffirmed some of the things that i saw in my dad that i was able to see glenn doing the same type of thing and a good producer in my mind is almost like a bartender psychologist you know you're basically trying to get someone to get naked with their vocal in front of you in three hours and you may or may not have a relationship with them. So you've got to connect with them somehow and get them to trust you to give you what you need um, to create a great record together. And still at the same time reassure them that there's zero, um, criti- like it, this is not about being critical, this is not about being judgmental. Right, it's about this, making a great record. Yeah, this is about us working together. Yeah, I will tell people constantly, you know, if you're gonna hit a note, even if it's flat, or it's in Q sharp, whatever key you want to pick it in, hit it with conviction. Q sharp. Q sharp. Just hit it with conviction. <laughs> when you're listening to yourself, you're not, you're not, you're censoring yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're going to hit a, a wrong note, hit it wrong as fuck, because at least <laughs> it's got passion behind it. Right. You know, nothing's going to leave the studio that you don't like and that I don't like. This is a place to be safe and experiment and let's. And fail. Yeah, and fail. Mm-hmm. You know, and guess what? If we fail, we erase the file and start again. So, so for you, do you, do you think, cause I, cause you know, Jimmy and I talk about this a lot about being in the studio. Cause I think I've said to you before, I'm like, you're a therapist. Totally. Like you're there, you're there to get them to a point where they feel comfortable and they're not, they're not embarrassed mm-hmm. to fail. They're not embarrassed to say, oh, that doesn't work, you know, but at least you tried it. I mean, how much of that is, because it seems to me that like a lot of it is, is like you have to build this trust. You have to. And you have to do it quick. Yeah, because there's, I mean, even with established artists, there may be established artists that think they know what their sound is and how they should sound. And I might not agree with it. So my whole thing is, I'll tell you what, I will do exactly what you want. But when we're all done, give me what I want to. And if you don't like it, I won't use it. But at least give it to me so we can at least try. You know? I feel well, like we do, that, we do that on shoots. We do we do like the mm-hmm. where they're like, you know, we want it fucking that way, whatever. And it's like, eh, you don't like to me. Like it, it, it's not a pompous thing. It's just like you know, it's like who you know. I I, I don't want somebody how, telling me how to make a cake who hasn't made a thousand cakes before. But, but every once in a while, you you end up with something that you're like, oh man, it works. Again, they're absolutely right. You know? you're like I don't agree with it, and you try it, and you're like, oh god damn it. Yeah. <laughs> It worked and it looked good. I, I've I've deluded myself again into thinking that I'm right all the time, <laughs> um, you know. And and but we always do like the thing where it's like you know we we do what is planned. Mm-hmm. We do what was agreed on with with clients or with with producers or whatever. And then we go, okay, now we want to do a couple for us. Well, just yeah, you to, have just to take to yourself. You have to take yourself out of your comfort zone sometimes to do something you didn't know you were capable of. I think even for the performer, you have to. Hundred percent. It's, it's very hard. Right. You but know. I would feel like nervous, like going in front of somebody like Jack, knowing that he's had all these hits and stuff like people when they work with us, you know, nobody knows the stuff that I we've mean, is done. That, is that part of the thing, too, where you have people you come know? in and they're like, sometimes they're, they're they want to impress and you. Sometimes and, you're timid. And they're over, they're overconfident. You know, you, I fucking you, got this. You, so you, you try to gauge it, you know, you for me, I, I, I try to be real and keep them real. And if I feel like there's something there and they're not talking about it, I'll try to bring it out just to get the elephant out of the room, whatever it is. Um, there's, I've only had like a couple of experiences with people that I just wasn't sure how to deal with them. And usually, I think both times they were young and inexperienced. I had one artist who, you know, back in the day when we would work with uh, all live instruments, right? you'd go into a session with 
basic either either outright charts or usually just lead sheets sometimes just demo tapes um musicians would listen down take some notes we'd talk about what we wanted they'd run through it once twice i'd make a couple changes they'd make a couple changes and then we'd record the thing i had an artist who was uh, so offended because she said how can these hired musicians know the soul of me as an artist and my song in three hours when they're just learning the song. Oh my gosh. Why didn't you have them in rehearsals? And I went, um, well, let's see, because they're absolute pros and this is what they do for their living every single day. And honestly, what you're going to get in three hours is going to destroy anything you would have gotten if you had them practice for 20 hours before. Right. And I mean, is there something about the organicness of it where it's like yeah, fresh it's, and it's new? And it's, yeah, because to me, a great, especially in that type of situation, what I enjoyed about those days was it was if the session went well, it was bigger than you as the producer and him as the guitar player and him as the drummer. What you came out with was was collaborative and bigger than everybody, you know. And that's where it, all those great records from the seventies, eighties, into the nineties, um, with that where there were live tracking dates. How 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 difficult how how difficult was it to I mean because you're you're basically dealing with art so like you're an artist they're an artist but at the same time you're you're a technician too because mm -hmm. you're like I okay I know how to EQ this shit I know how to do you know I do and uh, I, I mean in those in those up. days I would I would I would rely on engineers more so even though I knew how to do it I wanted to focus on just you know being able just to work with the artist and exactly a, and a creator but. But at the same time, if an engineer tried to pull it, some shit, you'd be like, yeah. I don't think so. When, when, exactly. when we were doing the O-Town stuff, we had such little time to do it. Um, we had 40 hours with the guys. And um, they hired a, a really decent engineer, but he wasn't as fast as I was. And I was getting frustrated because I needed, I needed him to move as fast as I was thinking. So I let him go and I took over because I could just work quicker. I knew it was going to go smoother. How important how important it is to have somebody to be able to keep up with you in a production situation very important you know you want to it's all about making a great record however that is achieved um, and the last thing and you want to do is slow it down your move and 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 being able to make it the, the greatest engineers fast. I've ever worked with are invisible I don't even know they're there half the time until they start to speak to me they they just know what I need and they're there and the session just moves. That's right. so cool. So moving from what that, happens after Wilson Phillips. So after that, let's say. Um, so this is like, you said it was like 93, 94. Right. Then we moved and into, Mar into Martina. Martina and in Martina, yeah. Right, yeah. which was 97, 98. Um, then I did this kid named Boson for Capital. Um, we had, he had one one big hit called um, The Things We Live and Die For. Um, the... He the his album didn't come out in the states. Came out overseas and did well over there. But the next thing was um, probably O Town, which was two thousand and one. When did uh, you 2000, get hooked 2000. up? Because that? that was Jamie? a Diddy thing, was it that? No, O Town was um, signed to Clive Davis, and it turned into that afterwards. I think it somehow like Diddy became yeah the like making the, the band. Oh, making the, yeah yeah. Well, actually, we can go back. I so around ninety seven ninety eight, I started to work with a guy named Steve Kipner. Um, and Steve had written um, Let's Get Physical for Olivia, Olivia back, John, back yeah, in yeah. the day. Um, he wrote uh, Hard Habit to Break for Chicago. Um, he wrote Impulsive for Wilson Phillips. And we started to work together. And um, during the course of us working together, he wrote a song with another uh, partner um, of his and of mine, sometimes named David Frank. And the song is called Genie in a Bottle which I ended up actually tuning and comping for them, um, putting the helping to assemble the vocal. And uh, although in those days you didn't really get a lot of credit for tuning because it wasn't I mean, was really her, talked about. Christina. I mean, she, Christina we was think, great. But we Christina's think of her as a, like having this powerful voice in like this, this five foot frame. She, and she is, and she has a great voice. She didn't require a tremendous amount of tuning. What she did require, which was my opinion, or, or direction. Um, when I listen to a lot of the tracks, she, Christina has this growl, yeah, which I've deemed over the years the Star Search growl, where right. you go, and it just felt so forced to me, especially in considering nobody knew who she was. There was so much 
there were some tracks was that she had, a Mouseketeer? Wasn't she one of the Mouseketeers? Yes, yeah, she was. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, but there was a lot of the vocal tracks that had a lot of riffing in it. And to me, the song, when I first heard it as a demo, was so great that I wanted to try to remove a lot of that stuff and let, let her just be a part of the song. Um, and if you listen to that vocal, there's not a lot of riffing that goes on. She really is working with the song. Um, so for so riffing me, is a... Oh, yeah. Okay. There's like one in the beginning, I think, right? Yeah. That, I, I had the yeah. single. <laughs> um, so in continuing to work with Steve Kipner, we got a call from Clive Davis's office and they were looking for songs for this new group called O-Town. They had their first single called Liquid Dreams um, and they wanted something that could potentially follow it that was just as salacious uh, sexually. And we wrote a song called Every Six Seconds um, and that made it onto onto their debut album. And what's that about? Oh, it's about the concept that uh, I read somewhere that a ma- the, you, the male thinks about sex every six seconds roughly um the song is so catchy the song is so catchy and a lot of the people from like early 2000s that were like you know we're 90s in their 2000s like they love it well let me ask you let me ask you about like you know we were talking the other day like we're 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 slamming foreigner the other day right (laughs) and you're like this is my jam (laughs) and is it is it very hard because because I don't think a lot of people stand, understand pop music stands for popular music. It's not just Correct. genie in a bottle. Correct. That's, it's That's so why funny. It when when I was time. in high school, I had friends who were in bands. And, you know, even in high school, I was writing. Um, and I remember people saying, you know, like some of my friends, like, man, that's too pop. And to me, it wasn't a dirty word because pop meant popular. And yeah. it's like, you mean I'm too popular or my shit's going to be too popular? I was okay with that. Right. I wasn't looking at it as a sellout. Um but but sellout even in and of itself is just sellout to me equals success. It does. And I think what people think sellout is is like, you know, oh my favorite band is now endorsed. Mm, no, I see it as like a great song is on like a, like a burger commercial. <laughs> you know That's making I mean? money. <laughs> You yeah, you're going to be upset, but your bank account's okay with no, it. No, I know, but that's where that's what I equate that with. But if a great song has ingrained itself in the human consciousness, and it's run its course of being a great song on radio, and it'll still get played, why not move into other right. realms with it? Yeah. Expose it to a new. Maybe there's a whole new generation right. that's going to discover that song yeah. because it was Years in a later. burger commercial. Well, that's like what was that? What was it? Uh, what was the Dennis Leary thing where he's like, you know, when John Lennon died. If I'm not mistaken, that uh, Michael Jackson bought the Beatles catalog, yes, and then started licensing it out it was to on everybody. Like it was like Nike shoe commercials. commercials. It was yeah. like, and they then they you Revolution. Know, the, I think was yeah. The joke is, commercial. is like you know you, you play Revolution and you know uh, Paul McCartney or John Lennon is like, oh, I wrote a great TV advert there, you know. But mm-hmm. but that's what sells it because we're familiar with that. We're mm-hmm. like, you know, this song really makes me feel Well, you're good. making that connection now if you liked that song in the past to the product that's... Yeah, yeah and like you can I, turn on Shazam on your iPhone and, like, download the whole thing. When I started doing really shitty videos, like, when I first started out, like, and I started editing together, the the, the main criticism and compliment was, I don't know what any of it means, but the soundtrack's good. Because <laughs> I would pick all these songs that would work with it, that would make it go like, oh, this is fun. Like, ACDC should be here. I think ACDC should be in everything Casadega. that I do. Casadega had the Tom Petty song. Um, so what? So transitioning from from um, O-Town, like, what was that experience like? Because it wasn't just like, I'm in the studio or I'm <clears> recording. <throat> now I have to, you know, be in episodes. <clears throat> well... Did you get fa- like town. fans and stuff? Oh, I got recognized after that. Yeah, definitely. Did um, you did you get crazy people? Not from that. I, they definitely have had a few crazy people over the years, but no, not from that. So what was it like to to, to go like okay now I'm gonna be in a weird way a TV recognized person? It, it, to it me, was I just moody. At, it was just it was <laughs> part of the it was part of the territory I had to deal with. I, I wasn't looking at it as oh, this is a new career or anything like that, per se. It was just like, I remember that some of the first things I was really nervous when there were cameras around. Um, then, you, you know, you just get used to it, ultimately. The, I, I remember being very upset because um, during O-Town, they were, there was a person, their entire job was the 
black gaffer's tape, and they would gaffer tape my friggin' Marlboro cigarettes, <laughs> and they would gaffer tape anything. Oh, so because of product, mm-hmm. like the product. Yeah. Endorsement, right? Yeah. Product. yeah. Yeah, it'd cover everything. And you only had 40 hours in a time crunch. Yep. So what happens after O-Town? Um... Like I'm, so, I'm literally trying to be like, here's, here's. No, I'm, I'm giving you the talent. Okay. Um. So after O Town. Did you work with Jamie? Yeah. Well, there's lots of stuff that went around that was. I mean, there's so much. I'm giving you like the the, the highlights. Yeah. The clips. In in '98. '98. Yeah. '98. I wrote a song for the National Committee to Prevent Child Abuse, um, called "Love Shouldn't Hurt." And it was supposed to be like a mini We Are the World. It was Michael Bolton and Ann Wilson from Heart and Stephen Stills and um, Tamia Washington and uh, Michael McDonald and oh, that's your guy. Do yeah. it. Tons of folks. Yeah. Do the Michael McDonald. I can't forget. I'm not in love anymore. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> now, if, you, if you actually stick your fist and put it in your mouth while you're doing that, it actually sounds more like that. <laughs> so we're going to stop right there um, because it ran longer than we expected. And we're going to do a part two because we think that you guys need to hear it. But we also think that like a Lord of the Rings-esque length of time is is a lot to do in a single drive we're hoping that you can get through this in in your daily drive so and they liked it when we did that with jesse snyder we had jesse was great so so all these people from los angeles are coming out so we're giving you as much as possible you know so tune in for next week because part two of jack kugel will uh will blow your mind thanks for listening (laughs)